Hello, and once again, please enjoy the Glenwood Gator football show featuring Coach Jason Gibson. I'm your host, Ronald Frazier, and I will present some questions to the coach to talk about uh, this past week and also the coming week and what things are going on with Glenwood football. Uh, coach, first of all... I don't want to talk this week. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, those I, are the weeks you don't want to show up, right? Right, I understand. But there's one thing that we would want to mention that a lot of folks might not realize uh, is that even though Hurricane Irma did not really hit this area uh, like they were th talking right. about, uh, certainly it did affect your preparation for this week. Can you discuss? Oh, well, you got you got to prepare for that. You know, a lot of people lost power. You know, I was out of power for two, almost 24 hours, and I think a lot of people in Phoenix City went out of power. But the school made the right decision because of the precautions and. So they canceled school Monday, Tuesday. So we didn't find out Tuesday till about 11.30 that we could practice. Just, you know, the headmaster had to make sure that the school was safe, that it was cleaned up, that we had power. And so they resumed all normal school after school activities, but try to get a hold of all these different kids. You know, we don't, they don't all live in the same school district. So because they live, because it's a private school. And so we sent out text messages and emails and some people's cell service didn't work. Some people's emails didn't work because they didn't have power. So, not everybody got the message. So practice on Tuesday was a little sparse, it was a little thin, because you're trying to get everybody there and people are getting back to work and people are cleaning up their yard. So it was a, it was a, it was a task and a lot of decisions needed to be made. We even thought about trying to move the game to Saturday for the extra day, but uh, I figured we'd go with it and just play Friday night and keep it where it's at. Okay, well see, things do change despite the fact that you may not have some direct with Hurricane Irma. Certainly it had some uh, somewhat indirect to the preparation yeah. for this Friday. Um, although the, certainly the result was not what you wanted this past Friday. Uh, I thought maybe we would talk about a, as quarter by quarter sure. and just see uh, what you felt like. And the first quarter, the score was nothing to nothing at the end of the quarter. But Glenwood had some chances to score. Can you was, talk about that? There was two big plays in that quarter. One was the fumble. When did that happen? Uh, that happened uh, first quarter, I think maybe the first drive. Uh, you know, we fumbled the ball inside the 15-yard line, which was a backbreaker. Um, and then the second big play was we had the ball in the 10-yard line again, and we take a 30-yard sack. And so that puts you out of <laughs> I mean, it was just, you know, we talked about it with Bryce, but we just, you can't, you just got to fall down or throw the ball away or something. We, we, we keep going the wrong way. We keep running backwards, and it's just a correction, and... So instead of having it second goal from the 10, it's second goal from the 38-yard line. And I looked at my play sheet, and I'm being sarcastic. I don't have a play for that. I don't think many people do. But we got the ball back down a little closer. I got the best kicker in the league. We attempt the field goal, and we miss it. So, you know, it could have easily been 10 nothing, And uh, it's 0-0. Zero, zero. Okay. All right, so it's 0-0 zero, zero at the end of the first quarter. And then we start the second quarter. And uh, from what I could see, uh, Cameron O'Neill almost had a game in that one quarter, and you score 22 points. Can you talk about that? Well, I mean, you got all these different players here. We're still trying to find an identity. And if you look at the film, and this sounds crazy if you hear me saying this, if you watch the film, we played pretty poor offense, and I thought, I mean, just a lot of small details. But what's scary is as bad as we played throughout the entire game, not just the fourth quarter, but in the first quarter, the missed field goal, the, the, the fumble, the missed blocks, the just poor offense, and we still scored 35 points. That's what's scary because – that means we can put those big numbers up every game. But in the second quarter, you know, Cam had a great, you know, I thought Bryce stepped up in the pocket. He had a really deep ball right before half. Um, we had a slant route we've been working on where we read it. If they blitz, Cameron, you know, Justin runs a slant route, and he finally, we've been working on it all year in practice, and it finally worked. They, they were on the same page, and that's what I'm talking about. It's getting, getting all these players on the same page from a football mindset, not just a physical, it's not about physicality. Uh, there are high school kids, they're all within the same range. It's having a football common sense and building that, you know, 
having them to be able to see the same things that we see as coaches. And they saw it, and they scored. So they hit them on the slant, and then right before half, you know, they go prevent. There was 40 seconds left or something. They go prevent. We run a toss to Kaleem. Kaleem scored. The official, <laughs> the official is 20 yards behind the runner running down the field. Right, because Kaleem's pretty fast. He's way faster than yes, the official. Yes, he's a fast player. That's true. He's 20 yards past the official. He doesn't mark him out of bounds till after he's in the end zone. Because while he's running down the sideline, he never says anything. Never blows the whistle. Never signals stop a play. He keeps running. But the second Kaleem crosses the goal line, oh, oh yeah, he was out of bounds on the 15. Sure. So we run the same play again, and we faked it, and he threw the O'Neal in the slot, and he made another great play. And that put us where we were at. And then, of course, um, we botched the extra point, and Mason Hurd runs around for the two-point conversion. Gives us that extra. Could have played out for us in the end, but we wound up missing an extra point later. So um, it, it worked out really well for us, and uh, we're going to halftime feeling good. Yeah, you're up 22-7, to seven and really, the only thing you gave up was a, a long pass play, which can happen. Uh, yeah. uh, at least Scott's hit a 70-yard He was covered. Touchdown. He was blanketed. I mean, our guys, and the guy made a great play, just like Cam made great plays. He made a great play, made a great catch. We were there. It happens as football. Uh, you can't draw it up any better than that on defense, and the guy made a play. But, but you're still up 22-7 to seven yeah, I think they, I think they had two first downs in the first half. So they had, couldn't run the ball. Uh, they only ran for 86 yards the whole game. So... You know, shutting people down in high school, running the ball is what we needed to do, and I thought we did a good job first half. Okay, so we go to the third quarter, and that's where your ground game does start uh, being a prominent part of what you can do because you scored two touchdowns. Right. One, uh, Navy Harris had a nice run, and Kayleen Bonds made up for that. Fumble, with, yeah. You know, with a nice run. That was a fourth down play that Kayleen ran uh, to start the fourth quarter. Actually, it was right to the right. It was at the end of the third, start of the fourth. You know, Navy ran the end of the round for a touchdown, and uh, he's hard to tackle. He's just a big kid running the ball. So we got to get him the ball more. That's, that's my fault. And then Kaleem scores with, you know, the first play of the fourth quarter. So there's 11.51 left in the fourth quarter, and they get the ball back. And that's where, that's where we start. So. Okay. And then the fourth quarter happens. It's 35 to 7. Uh, is I uh, have to ask, because I'm, I'm, I was not at the game, Coach. Right. Uh, is Lee Scott's Eric Schuster, is his, the quarterback, is he that good or was it just I mean, he, may, he throws on time. He throws on time. He had, you know, all game. And I think in the fourth quarter, when I looked up, the way I look at it, and here's my issue, I think there, there, there was clock issues with the clock. There was major, major clock issues of when it started, when it didn't start, the whole fourth quarter. And – been doing this a long time, especially with arena ball. My thing, I know how to count possessions. I know by looking at it how much time a possession takes, even if it's three downs and out. And so when I looked up with 11 minutes left, they needed four scores, which means we're going to get the ball four times too. That's, that's eight possessions. There's only 11 minutes left in the game. I'm looking at it going, it's pretty much darn near impossible if – as long as we don't turn it over, don't give them a one-play touchdown. So, for example, if they get the ball after a possession and throw the ball and score in eight seconds, which they didn't do. Right. They didn't get an onside kick. And, you know, we just looked at all that, and, and I got a little conservative on offense, and you can look at it two ways. So Texas A&M blows a 35-point lead to UCLA. UCLA. Right. Well, in the third quarter, Texas A&M – keeps their foot on the gas, they keep running their no huddle offense. And what happens is they get in and out of the possessions too fast, right? And allows UCLA to get back into the game. So at the end of the game, all the people sitting in the stands, of course, and all the other coaches, you know, maybe me too, all you should have slowed the game down. If you had just ran the clock out and ran the ball, i.e. the Falcons in the Super Bowl, I mean, he could have ran the ball three times, kicked the field goal, the game's over. If he had just ran the ball out, UCLA wouldn't have had enough possessions to, to come back. So I'm thinking along that line. So I'm thinking they need – there's eight possessions and an 11-minute left. Fourth quarter. Fourth quarter. It's impossible with no turnovers and no interceptions and no one-side kicks and no one-play touchdowns. And 
you know, it just started. When they scored, I think there was like maybe about eight minutes left, maybe eight or nine minutes left to make it 35-14. 35-14. Okay. And I'm looking going, well, you know, there's eight minutes left. It's three touchdowns. It's still six possessions in eight minutes. That's, that's a, a minute ten of possession. That's, that's impossible. But, you know, we get the ball, and I was not going to throw it. I was not going to stop the clock. I, was, had, I let it run down every time to 10 seconds, and, you know, you could see me on the game film. I'm looking at the play clock, and I'm running it down, and I figure, hey, we'll run the ball three times. If I get a first down, I get a first down, but I'm not going to stop this clock no matter what, and we didn't. But, you know, we, we ran one play. We went to run a screen, and Bryce takes a 15-yard sack to the five-yard line. And all of a sudden, you can feel the air deflate on our sidelines, and you can feel them start to think, wow, we might be in this game. But there's eight minutes left. You're down by 21. There, there's really, it's almost impossible with the clock running the way it should. Multiple times I'm looking up, clock's not running. Or, you know, whatever it was. But so we punt. They get the ball. They drive the field. Not one play touchdowns, but they, they drive the field and. uh um, you know, 10 for them was a good player, you know, and, and we kept telling our guys, I think there was just some mistakes on defense that we didn't do um, from a defensive standpoint. But still, we had our chances. A couple times we had them third down because they were having two and three and four and five, six play drives. Again, from a time standpoint, it seems impossible. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then they scored to make it, you know, 35-21. I get the ball back again. I'm like, I'm not going to stop this clock. We're going to keep etching it down. And, um, of course, we don't score again. We, we punt it. They go down and score again. And then the key play on that was they botched the extra point because it's 35-27. And then they throw a flag on us on hitting the center, which we did. So when we hit the center, they reset the ball. And now they go for two, and they make it. That was the difference in the game. Because now they're only down by six. And I'm thinking, wow, they score kick an extra point, they're gonna win by one again. And the thing that kills me when I watch the film is the five extra points before that, they hit our center every time. So if you're gonna call it, it's we hit the center. And I'm telling you right now, Navy jumped over and hit their center and it was a penalty. It's a legit penalty. But you gotta call it the whole game. You can't just call it when it matters. Um, that was my only complaint, to be honest with you, was that. Watching our center get pummeled and then, then no flags. But So now it's 29-35. They kick the ball back, and now I'm thinking, okay, I need one first day. One day, I have two time muscle. I need one first down. One first down. The game is over. The game's over. We throw a screen. I'm standing at the first down marker. I'm standing at the sticks. Christian Clausell catches it. He crosses the 30 to the 31, and he's got the ball out to about the 33, maybe 32. It's not even close. It is, it's not even a judgment call close. The official comes running from 10 yards behind and marks, marks him a foot short. So now it's fourth and, fourth and what, not even a yard with a buck, maybe a buck 45 left which means the game's over if I get the first. Ball's on the 30-yard line. Honestly, thinking about it over again, I mean, you know, I went for it. I went for, I went for the win. I didn't want to give them the chance to give them the ball. And there was actually two thoughts in my mind, okay? If you punt it and you pin them, we, we, you know, we don't have an NFL punter, so we're not going to pin them inside the 10. You know, the ball's on the 30. They're probably going to get the ball about the 40, maybe the 35. We got to play defense, which we hadn't stopped them at all. And if we punt it and they drive from the 30, now if they score, you know how much time's on the clock? Zero. None. Yes. Now I had no chance. So I was trying to play the odds, and it really almost worked out for us in the end, too, because I knew if they got the ball back and I had some timeouts, if they scored quick and they made the extra point and I got a good kicker, all I need to do is get to the 30, 35-yard line with time left on the clock. So anyway... Uh, last year, we go for it on fourth down. The, the players wanted to do it. I have no problem. I, you know, I've always told my kids that we're in this together and that if 
we feel we can do it together, let's do it together. And they begged me, Coach, we can make this. And we didn't make it. We didn't make it. So it puts the pressure on the defense. And, uh, you know, that last play of the game, I knew it was going to 10. Everybody knew it was going to 10. We called the defense that it was going to 10. Everybody knew it. And we just kind of blew the coverage. Um, they score with 47 seconds left. Uh, 42 is 42 what I 42 seconds had. left, which was fine. I mean, in our offense, 42 seconds not a big deal. We're down by one. They make the extra point, so we're down by one. So um, we get the ball out. We get the ball to the 40-yard line. And, and, you know, it's just high, they're high school kids, and so I get it. You know, poor, you know, poor Christian had a great game, call sale number two, had a great game. He catches a pass. He crosses into their 40. We had just called timeout prior, and I'm saying to Christian, I'm like, whatever you do, get out of bounds. Get out, make the catch, get what you can get, get out of bounds. And um, he doesn't. He, like a high school kid, you know, I, I get it. You know, we can yell him as coaches. And he was, I was trying to score. Well, I know, but you got to get out of bounds. So we had to waste about seven more seconds to spike the ball. Of course, the clock was running then. And you picked up my sarcasm. And <laughs> yes. So we spiked the ball, and uh, the next play was really what broke our back. So we have the ball on the 40. I need really seven yards, maybe 10 at the most. And we got Cam Thomas Camacho. I can kick the ball for a chance to win the game. And we block, you know, we mess up the, the blocking scheme. The quarterback has about zero seconds to throw the ball, and he throws it in the dirt. We get an intentional grounding in the back. So that, that really caught, that was the game. If we get the intentional ground. If we hadn't got the intentional grounding, I could have taken a, I could have tried a field goal with the 35 yard line. I needed five yards. And I had 10 seconds left. That's easy. So the last play of the game, we have eight seconds, and we rep this every Thursday. We run the old hook and ladder. And we catch it. And two things happen on the play. One, Cam almost scored. But he could have just stepped out of bounds at the 20 and we could have kicked the goal on one again. We could have, he could have stepped out of bounds with one or two seconds left. Instead, he tries to juke the guy in bounds. Clock runs out. No time on the clock. Ball game. But what's ironic on that is we line up in an empty set, and the official calls us for an illegal formation. It says we had too many men on the line of scrimmage. Which I took a picture of the of the of the of the play, and we don't. I mean, they're off the ball. It's clear as day. And it's a judgment call, so you can't argue that. But what I argued was when you watch the film, if it's an illegal formation, when do you throw that flag? Before the play starts well, normally. Well, as soon as the play starts, yeah. you throw the flag. You watch it on film, the official, you can see him because he's across the field. He doesn't throw the flag until after we've caught the catch and laddled it to Christian. Once Christian catches the pass, I'm sorry, once Cameron catches the pass, you see him throw the flag. It just seems weird to me. I don't know. You read what you want to read into it. Again, we lost that game. Lee Scott didn't win it. We lost it. You know, we lost it in the fourth quarter. Officials didn't lose the game. But when you see stuff like that, it just makes you wonder, if you're going to call the illegal formation, why wouldn't you call it when the ball was snapped? I didn't understand why they waited until after we threw the pass, caught the pass, lateraled it to Cameron, and as he's running, then you see the official in the background, back where the play started, throw a flag. So even if we ran out of bounds, they would have called it back. So it's a weird game. You know, it's a long weekend. Then you got the hurricane. So then you don't practice Monday. Then you got all day Tuesday. So you sit around and you think about it. It's probably, and I've told my kids, through, through high school and college and Europe and Canada and arena and all the places I've been, I think it's 300, almost 400 football games in my life. That has got to be the worst loss I've ever been a part of. Ever. Hands down. Never seen it. And it's funny, you know, I sit here, you know, and, and I sit here, and luckily for me, I was on the other end of that in the arena season where we came back from a game we should have never been in. And it's, trust me, it's exciting as a coach. You're like, woo, thank God we won the game. Woo, I feel for that guy. Because now I know what it feels like. And um, the good thing is you get to play again this week. And you get to, you know, try to redeem it. But it also, it, it showed some flaws in our team that we continually need to fix. Look, I will gladly sacrifice these games if it makes us better in the playoffs. And we're going to be in the playoffs. So, 
you know, do I want to go nine and one and lose in the first round? Absolutely not. I don't. So I just got to continue to get these guys where we need to be. We talked about it in practice this week. I just don't think we're struggling with an identity as a team of what we do really well. I tell you what we've done really well. We've shut the run down, even against Monroe. I mean, I thought we handled the ball you know, pretty well against Monroe. You got to figure we're out Gage Williams, our best linebacker, who's out for the season. We're starting, you know, the last three games, we've held three straight teams under 100 yards, rushing the ball. Uh, it's going to be a huge task this week against the Georgia Tech of the AISA. So, uh, you know, and so we, we, we've done some really good things, but I think offensively we can be even better, and that is what's scary. Well, you did have some pluses on the offensive side as well, and it, as you talked about the pluses on the defense, the fact that as far as the first four games of the year, you have stopped the run. Yeah. And even though as a team they had less than – Kayleen Bonds almost had 100 yards rushing. He had 96 yards officially running by himself, right. not including what other folks had. So there are some positives. Um, and, of course, the, the uh, passing offense, as long as you got Clausell O'Neill. He threw for three – 63. 363 yards and three touchdowns. And the most important part on that is he was like 26 of 36. That's, I don't know what percentage that is. If I did my math real quick, that's, that's a upper 60s. That's in high school, that's pretty darn good. Yes. And I tell you what, he struggled at the beginning of the year. Mechanics, um, decision making, leadership. He is starting to really come around. He is, and he's a junior. And to, he is starting to make, he can make every throw in the field. That's, if you got a kid that can do that, so that's problem number one, that's solved. Because when you're a high school kid and you can throw an out route from one hash all the way over to the other hash, that's special. And it's hard to find that. So he's, he's coming along and what we have to do as an offense is say, you know, and I sit there as a coach, I'm like, we've got to be able to run the ball. Got to be able to run the ball. Well, you know, if I keep sticking that square peg in that round hole and it don't work, eventually you just got to do what you do. And if we can throw the ball, then that's what we're going to do. You know, and we'll run it to, to, to set up the pass, but if I got to throw it 40 times a game and throw for 400 yards, then that's what we'll do. And so I'm trying to figure out that, that identity for us offensively. But... I mean, you can't give up 35 points in a high school game. And now we're talking about Tuscaloosa Academy. Oof. They come in the game, two and one. And I think one of the most interesting things is, is while y'all were battling Lee Scott, they played the defending state champions from right. last year, Bessemer, and double the score on them, 42-21. Yeah, yeah. So that was a, that was a shock. Points. They were losing that game. They were down 21-7. to seven. They were losing that game to Bessemer. Bessemer's out seven players. They're out, you know, Bessemer's out their best player, number seven. That'd be like us not having O'Neal. Um, they, their best offensive lineman broke his leg. He's out. So they were down. I think Bessemer's really down this year as far as to, they're just really battered with the, you know, hammered with the injury bug. Mm -hmm. Well, that being said, they were winning 21-7. to And then they kind of had a little meltdown kind of like we did and then let Tuscaloosa bask in the game. Tuscaloosa has a really good running game, and they do it well kind of like a Paul Johnson, Georgia Tech, and they will wear you out. And I think they wore out Bessemer. It's just the constant, you know, I think they run maybe five plays, if they're lucky. They run one formation the entire game, the entire game. And I even doubled back on the film from last year. Right. It's the same thing. I mean, the difference from last year for them to this year for them is talent. They've got way better talent than they had last year because last year they ran the same exact offense. They ran the same exact defense. But now they got way better players. They got players to where they can compete with anybody. Um, and right now they're in the driver's seat. They're in the driver's seat. I mean, if you look at the conference, I mean, we're the last team in the way because they're, they're going to throttle Lee Scott. You know, they're, they're going to handle them well. And, um, yeah, they're, they're going to handle them well. So they've already knocked out Bessemer. So, you know, you're looking at the game sat Friday night. It's a huge game. Because if they beat us, they, they pretty much locked up the – because Edwards down, they got a bunch of JV kids. Springwood, you know, I mean, Tuscaloosa is just that much more talented than everybody else right now. So if they win Friday night, then they, they got the number one seed. 
Well, this early in the season. They are the Knights, and you've had a lot of good luck with teams named the Knights. You did bring that up. I like that. So. I think maybe we'll be good. But we got good players, too. They, they do a great job running the ball. They run a solid defense. They're going to take away the pass. They're going to take away the pass and make us run it. Um, they play a cover two. And so anytime we play a cover two with two safeties high, you got to run the ball, and that's going to force us to do, you know, do something that we're not great at. So it, it, it's going to be a tough game, man. Well, I think that what you're, from what I hear you saying is guys like Kayleen Bonds, John Burnett, and Navy Harris we'll are going to have to step up and yep. see the ball and do something Look, good. Look, those three players are as good as the high school players anybody in the conference. So we're going to give them the football and tackle them. You know, and you can't get 20 yards every play. Every play, and that's what I try to tell these kids. You know, a lot of times, one of the two best plays we ran all night Saturday, Friday night against Lee Scott, the two best plays the entire night, we threw a flat route in the flats to John Burnett for about three yards. And we threw a, another flat route week to um, Kayleen Bonds for about six. And what makes those plays so special was we read the blitz, we dinked it down, we dropped, we, we, you know, we checked down, we threw him the ball, and we made the play. And, you know, that's, that's football. And when you watch an NFL game, every play is not a 20-yard game. You just got to keep methodically being consistent, and, and that's what we're going to try to do. And that's what you want to see from your team this Friday, correct? Yeah, I, I want to see, you know, we're doing a good job. I want to see us compete, and, uh, and, 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 and it's a big game. It's, it's for first place. You know, we beat Tuscaloosa, all of a sudden there's a four-way tie for first place. And now we're back, and now we're in the driver's seat. So there's a lot on the line. We'd like to remind the fans that after this show, we will have a replay of the Lee Scott game here on CTV Beam uh, to you to be able to watch uh, those good r plays that Glenwood did have, especially in the first half. So Just turn it off in the up. fourth quarter. Just watch it through <laughs> three, and then go ahead and turn it off and go to bed. <laughs> And now we've got a big, big game Friday. And so we would appreciate Coach Gibson being here. And we want to thank all those viewers that are watching this show and the replay of the game. And we look forward to Glenwood's output and play and hopefully a good win to talk about next week. Well, you said the Knights, so I'm looking forward to it. All right. Thank you, Coach. Thanks.